Okay, I'm going to begin. It seems that uh, we've hit close to our registrants. So welcome everyone. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, and a very good morning to those joining from the Spare office in Vancouver where it's 6 a.m. Uh, we have people coming to this webinar from all over the world. So thank you for spending your time with us. We're very excited to host this webinar. It is Spare's second. And this webinar is titled By Bus or By Taxi? The answer is both. So as the title suggests, we will be discussing how to include third party operators into a transit system. The webinar will be broken into three parts. So the first section, I'll be posing questions to our panelists. The second, uh, second part will be questions that I have received in advance from the audience. And then the third questions will be live questions submitted in real time during this webinar through the chat box. Uh, and I'll be posing them to the panelists. So just uh, again to say that, if you have a question during the webinar, please submit it through the chat box. If your question is not answered uh, but during this webinar, obviously we have time constraints, please feel free to email me uh, or just submit it through the chat box and we will make sure that we go through all of them and get back to you. So uh, let me begin. So to begin, I'd like to introduce our panelists. We are thrilled to have Manel Rivera joining us from EMT Palma. Manel is a transportation engineer. Uh, Manel, could you say hello? Manel? Hi, everyone. Thank you, Manel. Uh, then we have Camila Gonzalez Arango, who is a growth representative for SPARE based in Europe. Camila? Could you give us a hello? Hello, everyone. Thank you. And uh, lastly, we have Lars Klunby, who is SPARE's operations lead in Europe as well. Lars, could you say hi? Hi. Thank you. And myself, Tanya Castle. So I'm a, a commercial representative based here in North America. So we are coming to you from uh, Palma, Barcelona, Oslo, and Montreal. So a very diverse group of panelists and a very uh, vast a range of participants today. So to begin, uh, some of us have had the pleasure to, to visit Spain, uh, maybe even Palma, but many of us haven't, but we'd like to set the stage for those attending. So Manel, could you give us a, an idea of what your city is like and your transportation offering? Uh, just to paint a picture of uh, where you are. Manel? Sure. Um, thank you, Tanya. Um, Palma is a medium city. It's uh, around 450,000 inhabitants. It's the capital city of the Balearic Islands on the main island, Mallorca. Um, the municipality counts about uh, around 40,000 hotel beds. Hi. Yeah, please continue, Manel. You're fine. Okay, sorry. Um, so this adds um, uh, a lot of, well, a problem, it's a challenge, it's a seasonality on the island, uh, especially in, in the capital city of Palma. So uh, to serve the city, uh, we have 200 buses uh, moving around. And um, in 34 lines, uh, day, night, day time lines and four night lines, and then um, uh, the model share, the, the model speed for Palma, it's 15% share for transit. So there's a lot of uh, room for improvement still here. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so that takes me to my next question about the challenges you faced. Obviously, we've been going through a global pandemic, which presented its own challenges uh, that many transit agencies around the world have experienced. But could you tell us about those challenges that came with the onset of COVID-19 and some of the challenges you were experiencing before the pandemic began? Yeah, um, actually, it's more interesting to talk about the one before. And I guess the challenge is common to everyone, that is to gate to get a great transportation system um, because it's the only way to convince people to leave their cars at home and, um, and um, convince them to use public transportation or other, other active modes. So um, what we did 
was the first phase in Palma. We launched the bus network redesign in 18th December last year. Um, so we tried to um, set or to get any um, bus we had or as much as we could to the main axis. So we defined 12 main corridors of high demand with buses running every five to 11 minutes. So um, the second phase was the challenge of getting a good transportation system, a good quality service to rural areas. And that's where um, we defined the RT project so around, started one year and a half ago. And it's just that the pandemic, the pandemic of uh, COVID-19 just gave us the opportunity to launch it. Uh, but it, the challenges were, were well-defined before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as you said, uh, the pandemic, so during this COVID-19 period, you were able to, to take the opportunity to launch the service. So what exactly did you launch uh, in terms of an on-demand service as part of your overall uh, transportation network? Yes, um, well, we had the DRT system since 2009, which was very primitive. Um, and then what we did was to spread it, to expand it to using technology. We did it without technology. And um, we felt that we needed to expand it and we needed to combine buses, taxis, because one of the main challenges was seasonality, as we said, and also because we needed this flexibility of using uh, different vehicles. And also we needed to include um, taxi sector on the transportation system because we feel like um, we need to provide a combined solution and just one solution, not different transportation systems uh, moving around the city, not connected. So, um, what we, we wanted to do, and it was included in the Sustainable Urban, Urban Mobility Plan, was to include, uh, was to expand the DRT system and to include um, taxis. So um, we just waited for the right time. And why was COVID-19 the right time? We needed to reduce the risk of having drivers around the city without people inside. So it's just a matter of why putting people at risk if you, there's no need. Uh, also, the bus capacity was reduced to 30%. Uh, we were in a lockdown in Spain. And um, so that gave us the opportunity to expand something, to put something on, on the streets, which we could control, which we could actually give personalized customer service um, to guarantee a, a good uh, implementation. And that's what uh, we just did uh, three months ago now. Okay, fantastic. Manel, I just noticed all the maps of uh, bus routes behind you, like a true transportation planner there. <laughs> fantastic. Um, Camila, so as um, Manel stated, uh, they included taxis uh, into this on-demand offering. So this is something we refer to as trip brokering. Could you explain uh, what is meant by the term trip brokering and uh, how, it, how and why it works? Sure, yeah, so SPARE has the ability to include third-party operators into any demand-responsive transport service. And that's a feature that we call SPARE fleets or that it's generally called uh, trip brokering. So basically what it does, it allows public transport operators to have flexibility on how they want to run their service. It could be with a fleet of dedicated vehicles, with, which is usually the case. Uh, so let's say a bus or a minibus with a corresponding driver with a program duty in a certain area. But in this case, they could also count with non-dedicated fleets and vehicles that are fully equipped with the technology to take rides, which is basically our, our driver app, without necessarily having a program schedule because they can log in and out whenever they want and they can accept and reject those trips. So it provides a lot of different ways to implement the service. It goes very, very well with as a backup to a dedicated vehicle. So let's say you have your fleet that is enough to cover most of the day's demand, as you can see now in the image uh, in the slide, uh, because it fits fine for the low demand periods of the day. But maybe when you have these peak times, which usually means longer waiting times for the user and overall poor quality of the service, 
instead of using another vehicle with another driver and all the costs that it incurs, you can use these extra vehicles that are probably already in the streets, like taxis, as part of, of the solution. So for the user, it's transparent because they get, they get picked up anyways, whether it's a bus or a taxi or whatever vehicle. And for the operator, it's a good way to cover that demand without using their own resources. Um, or, or, or you could use it as a main fleet, no? Like in the case of BMT, taxis are the main fleet. And then sometimes they have a dedicated vehicle and sometimes they don't, which I think is very innovative as well. So there's this whole spectrum of possibilities in, into this feature, basically to help operators manage their limited resources better and uh, maintain a good quality service towards the user. Great, thank you for that explanation. That was uh, very clear. So um, we have heard that taxis have been included in uh, transit systems in the past. So it's not necessarily new to include taxis. Um, what is different about this? Is it the technology component? Is it the fact that they have both uh, their own ability to do their own work as a taxi and then also the work uh, with Spare using the Spare driver app? What's the innovation here? Yeah, so as you said, there are a few, a DRT or Data Ride or all these kind of flexible services, especially at least in Europe, which is the region that I know of. Uh, to not go too far, Palma had a, a on-demand service before, but what we found is that a, they usually have to be pre-scheduled probably since the day before uh, or a couple of days in advance. Uh, so what usually happens is that the operator take their reservations by phone, they gather all the bookings for the next day, then send it to the taxi company to do the whole route, the planning, the matching. So it's still a very manual process, as Manel stated before, and the operation is also very hard to monitor. So by doing this process automatically with, with Spare, you can have like several uh, positive changes. One, you can improve the quality of the service overall by providing not only pre-scheduled, but also on-demand service, which for the user, it means that they're allowed to change their minds and change their plans on the spot without use having to pre-schedule one day in advance. Uh, you could forget about manually gathering all the requests and coordinating the matching and the routing, etc. You could monitor the operation easily and gather more data regarding the service. You know exactly what taxi did what trip and pay the exact uh, fare to each taxi and just by downloading the, the report with all the trips. And of course it has the potential to scale up the service. So a manual process might work very well in a small area for a specific service, but if you want to expand it and maybe replicate it, um, there's still going to be like a double uh, of the effort in, in that case. In our case, it would be uh, just automatized and of course it would be just drawing a polygon in another area and start operating with the same fleet or the fleet that operates there or to talk with the taxi company that works there and then you have a, another operation. So I think this is what Palma has been doing since we started. They've been increasing the amount of, of zones, which I think Manel is gonna explain later. Mm -hmm, definitely, thank you. So we've heard uh, the what and the why, uh, Lars, and Camila actually touched on this a little bit of how to do it. Um, could you talk a little bit about what is done between Spare and our partner agency when we implement a service like that? What are the steps that are taken? Sure. Um, so I, I think again, it's it's important to remember that this service was launched in 48 hours, right? So from signing the contract to actually launching the service. So there are a lot of things that we will usually do before we launch, such as simulations that we didn't do in uh, in this specific example. Um, in Palmo's case, they had a pretty clear idea on what they wanted to accomplish. Um, so we basically dived straight into implementation, uh, and I think we. I think we demonstrated, demonstrated that setting up a service within the Spare platform is relatively easy. Um, you can actually do, we say on our website, you can do this in a, in a few seconds. Uh, a few minutes, you have something at least. Um, <laughs> it's, it's important to remember here that much of the complexity in launching such a service is, is on the ground, right? Communicating to riders, preparing uh, operations, securing drivers, in this case, uh, taxi drivers 
Uh, and that is really the time consuming activity uh, in this project. Uh, so I'm extremely impressed with uh, Monel and EMT Palma on how uh, fast they were able to move with this launch. Thank you for the reminder. I did forget to say that this service was launched in 48 hours, which is a record for, for Spare and our partners. So congrats also to, uh, to EMT from myself and the rest of the team. Manel, uh, that is quite an accomplishment, 48 hours, but if given the chance, would you do it the same way again? Uh, and why was it done so quickly? What would you change if you were to redo the process? Manel? Well, um, yes, yeah, uh, Lars said we did it in 20 years. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, sorry, there's a little bit of a delay. Please go on. You were saying you did yeah. it in eight hours. Yeah. Yeah, we needed to act fast, so we did. Um, given the opportunity, just have some rest at night and. Uh, Give, uh, give you some time, maybe one week or two is enough. Uh, but it was a challenge. It was needed to be done as fast as we, as we could. We started on a Saturday, which we thought was the best day to start. Um, so yeah, as Lars said, the most time consuming um, activities were trying to communicate to train in just one day, actually. Uh, so we focused on just a few taxi drivers uh, two bus drivers to get uh, the service on the Saturday and try to communicate uh, as best as we could via internet, uh, our web page, and uh, on the few stops that we started. Um, but so yeah, afterwards when we expanded the service bit by bit, uh, after just one month of operations, we felt comfortable to to actually expand it to a few more different zones in the in the city. Um, and having a bit more of time uh, being able to communicate was actually much way more relaxing uh, and we felt even better. So I would encourage other agencies that if they have to do it, if any pandemic or anything else occurs, just do it. It's, uh, it's doable and uh, actually it's great to, to find yourself in the position that you've done it. But um, if it's just absolutely necessary, otherwise just take a few more days to, to do things uh, even better, I guess. Great, well, I mean, it's certainly impressive and you, you are the record holder for the time being. So <laughs> something to be proud of. And, uh, and obviously since launching the service, you've seen some evolution uh, in your trips, in your service zones, you were saying it's growing. Could you walk us through this slide uh, a little bit and, and explain how, given the three months you've had, you've been able to evolve and, and make changes to, to the service? Yes. Um, well, as I said, we started with a very re reduced number of stops. Um, given the time and given the circumstances. Um, we started with just two EMT drivers and just one van and uh, with about 20 taxi drivers uh, because they only could work one out of six days. So we needed a lot of them, uh, but actually they just worked uh, two or three. They were um, online, just two of, or three uh, of them at the very beginning. Um, but the number of taxi drivers just after the launching, we, we were focused, we, we focused to, to get taxis involved. So we, the number of taxi drivers uh, grew up pretty fast. Uh, out of uh, 1,200 taxis in Palma, we got around 100 something in a week or maybe in two weeks maximum. Um, and that was a, a relief because we knew that we could guarantee the, the service. So we started to lean more on taxis than on, on our van, as we see on the, on the slide. Um, at the very beginning, there are more, way more trips on non-dedicated vehicles on taxis than on, on our van. Afterwards, uh, after one month of operation and uh, later on, we've started to introduce a bit more our, our buses so that also, we can test uh, that our buses run effectively, that our drivers are comfortable with it. 
and um, that uh, we can also evaluate the waiting times with uh, one van or two vans and also um, to see the possibility of, um, of uh, start operating this uh, as the way it was designed, I guess, that it's having a, a van and then some taxis uh, as a backup. Because till the moment we are using the R buses as backup, which we are pretty comfortable with that and we are not really sure of wanting to change it. But we need to be aware that in a seasonal um, city uh, as we are, taxi drivers will not be as available as we want all the time. So we need to be ready for putting our buses uh, out there. And that's the, the moment we are now. The trips, number of trips uh, are growing daily in the different zones. Uh, also because the mobility restrictions after the lockdown are relieved. So um, yeah, it's just growing as fast as the rest of the network. So we are very comfortable with that because actually people that, that use it are, are really using it. That's fantastic to hear. So um, sounds like you've spent a lot of time uh, thinking on this, implementing it and improving it. Um, Lars, uh, you know, you know, and we know at Spare that Manel has be, has gotten himself a reputation for being a whiz at the Spare network. He's teaching us new ways to use the software um, in some cases. What are some of the unique ways that, uh, that Palma, EMT Palma has, has used the Spare platform? Yeah, so uh, not only did they launch uh, super quickly, uh, but their setup is also pretty, pretty unique. So they have a, a service bookable by a phone, so you can call in uh, or you can order uh, through the rider app. It's on demand or scheduled and it's with dedicated vehicles or taxis as we've, uh, as we've talked about now. Um, but in addition to this, they combine different parameters and settings in the uh, in the platform um, uh, to create a service that is somewhat of a hybrid DRT fixed line. Uh, and that combination we haven't really seen before. Um, so by doing that, they, they both provided a good rider experience, uh, but also enabling efficiency gains such as uh, increasing pooling ratio or limiting empty driving. So that was, uh, that was really interesting to see. Um, and I think it's worth to mention that with a flexible uh, system like the Spare platform, you have this ability to tweak and iterate to find the most suitable setup for you and your organization. And that could then be a pure door-to-door uh, -door on demand service or a fixed line or kind of anywhere uh, in between. Um, and after launching, uh, you can continue to improve, uh, the, improve the service and make changes within seconds, right? Uh, and it was really great to see Manel, how he really uh, tested our system to the limits. Uh, they found the setup they, uh, they thought was good for them and then continued to add on and expand. So uh, su super interesting to see. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, so that was a great segue into my next question, discussing how, uh, what you said, Lars, of how riders can call a ride and, and obviously you and Manel talking about the evolution of the service. So Manel, could you speak to the perception of the service? So how has this changed uh, been received by the drivers? What do they think about the new on-demand component of their transport uh, service? Yeah, at our drivers or the bus drivers, my colleagues actually, um, were kind of reluctant at the beginning because they saw it as a service cut but they fastly understand that it wasn't a cut, it was a redistribution of resources actually. We were putting on the street nearly the same number of buses, but in another place, uh, it was hard time. And um, actually when we started devoting more and more our own fleet and they got involved with it and uh, get used to the app, um, they like it actually. And that they realize that it's a way better service than, than they were providing with the same job they were doing. And actually, I think it's very satisfying for, for one that um, you are driving and you actually deliver a better service than, than before, right? And then we have taxi drivers that all, all, uh, overall, they are happy with the application, with the app. Uh, they uh, actually tested it and they gave us some feedback also that we sent to Sphere and we 
and they are working on it and if they feel so, uh, but mostly um, it's uh, a very good answer for them. Uh, and um, now we'll see what happens in the next uh, month when they have more, more work. But at the moment where there was no one moving around, uh, giving this opportunity to taxi drivers, I, I think they are really um, uh, thankful for that. And uh, they understood that we need to provide a joint service as, as was the objective. So from the driver's perspective, we are very satisfied, I guess. Fantastic. Um, now for the taxi drivers, just to be clear, they have the opportunity to both work as a driver as part of this EMT on demand offering, and then also as their own private uh, taxi service. Yes, absolutely. Um, they are on the streets, they, they do their normal job, and if the ride comes, comes in and they are free, they accept it, and uh, they do the service for EMT, and then we pay for them at the end of the month. But uh, yeah, of course, we don't want it to put more uh, cars on the street. There are enough, so uh, we just use it better, I guess. Fantastic. So you explained that, you know, it, uh, there was a bit of a apprehension in the beginning and then both your EMT drivers and taxi drivers have been very pleased with the service and the change uh, that they, uh, they've they seen and how now they've really stepped up the quality of what they're doing. What about from the rider perspective? Uh, how have riders responded to this change? Uh, that's the first question. The second question is, you know, were they used to using an app already or were they used to calling in already or was it completely new uh, behavior change? No, so it was a completely new uh, behavior change. Uh, they, um, no one, actually you can have an app to, to uh, get the real time information, but not uh, to ask for the service in those areas. So um, at the beginning, it was uh, the hard times of the lockdown and the users actually understood it. And um, as we could get a personalized uh, customer information and one by one, even me asking for the, asking the, um, answering the phone was a, a very nice experience to, to get to know them actually. And you could know them uh, by name. Uh, when they, you answer the phone, it's like, oh, hey, how are you? But then afterwards it grew up, it grew. And um, from the, the people that was already using the service before the pandemic and before the change, uh, they feel like it's a way better service. Actually, we did some surveys apart from the, um, the automatic one that the app uh, provides, but we did some surveys by phone uh, to the users. And what they say is, I go way faster now than before. And actually our calculations is they save around 30% to go to the center of the city. Um, but then you have those people that never use transit, but they all want to see a bus in front of their, play, of their houses. Uh, and this is now the hard opposition of it. Uh, people that actually want their regular line, not to use it, but to say they have it. So now is the moment to, to uh, convince also these people that uh, the quality service is better even if they have to to do a change uh, at some point to transfer or whatever but I guess we're gonna we're gonna be able to make it I hope great thank you just to be clear it's a 30% savings in time that your your riders have experienced yeah counting the waiting time um, and the travel time uh, connecting at some point to a direct line uh, that goes through the highway to the city of the, to the center of the city, the time, uh, the cuts in uh, time travel is around 30%. Yeah. Depends on the zone, but yeah. Yeah, that, that's huge savings and uh, definitely goes to your goal of making transit great and getting people out of uh, personal cars. Um, so this brings me to my last slide and then I'll be uh, opening the floor to questions. Uh, so for the future of DRT in Palma and more broadly, Camila, we've heard Manel talk about you know the, the the response from both drivers and riders, and obviously him being in the you know in the in the operations in the the back office uh, and really seeing the system from a bird's eye view how it's working. Um, how do you see the EMT Palma model being applied elsewhere, or or could it be applied elsewhere as it is in in Palma? Yeah, absolutely. Um, actually, I think 
DRT has a lot of potential for the future. I think it has proven to be a great complement to fixed public transport so far. And it has great potential as a first and last mile solution in rural and suburban areas, like, like the uh, approach in Palma. But also specifically about trip brokering and what we've discussed in this, in this session, this spurred, uh, spurs mixed fleet approach goes further and can provide the ability of combining not only different fleets, but also different kinds of services. Because we've talked about taxis here, but just to make clear that the potential is bigger because when you say taxis, you could be ride hailing or tourism or you name it, no? The amount of operators or fleets that could be integrated into the service. So um, let's say you run a DRT, but there's also school transport, special needs transport, community transport, um, non-emergency medical transport, all those kind of non-fixed transport services they, that they usually work very much like in silos, very independently. They could have, we could have like a more holistic approach to all of them and then uh, use them centralized in the same platform, but still be operated by different fleets and by different operators. So it's a, it's a real comprehensive uh, solution that we see for the future because you could even combine different users from different services in the same vehicles. Uh, I think it's a step further in, in terms of fleet optimization and, and the potential is really, really huge for DRT. Uh, and just to mention something about the emergency that brought us to this project, um, we see in SPARE, we see public transport as the backbone of mobility, especially in Europe, which where it's, it's really basic it's the base. But sometimes we see that it's quite a static system and it re responds to a demand that has been historically quite stable. But then COVID has proved that that demand can vary and then it can vary overnight. So we realized that maybe we were not so prepared for this. It's very hard to provide a static service to a changing demand. So what we're trying to do is to understand demand as a more variable uh, like as a variable rather than a constant in this equation and make and make supply adjust to it, no? What we present with DRT is, is more or less that, is just um, provide these tools to public transport so that it allows them to adapt immediately to new variations of demand and ultimately become a more resilient system. Fantastic, thank you. And you did mention how we can combine rider types uh, in a variety of different vehicles that can be brought onto the spare platform. So that was the subject of our last webinar, co-mingling. So uh, for everyone watching, if you're interested in learning more about co-mingling of rider types, uh, please check out that webinar. In fact, we'll probably attach it to this email since uh, Camilla talked a little about commingling. It makes sense to do so. So um, Manel, last question as part of the presentation. Uh, you know, you were very courageous to launch this system uh, during COVID-19, although it did present a great window of opportunity. Uh, it certainly didn't go without its own challenges to, to launch so quickly. Um, where do you see the, the DRT service going now? So your demand uh, responsive transit system, where do you see that going uh, now that we're coming out of lockdown? Do you see it expanding, staying at it as is, or what's the future for EMT's on-demand service? Well, I totally agree with Camila that uh, the RT is the future um, or is part of the solution more than the future. Um, we really hope that we can uh, stabilize, stabilize uh, this in Palma. Um, I guess it's, uh, we're gonna make it. Um, uh, we are working now actually in not growing in zones, but automatizing the, the billing process to taxis and uh, actually settle everything down. Um, and with uh, the rest of the EMT team, which is uh, actually pre-involved in, in this project now after the launch. And um, we are also working to, to integrate the service into the fare system uh, so that they can validate the transportation card also in taxis more than um, as they do now that they only uh, validate the transportation card when they board the bus, actually. Um, but uh, this is the future. We're working now hard to, to 
set everything, uh, to put everything in the, in the right um, place, uh, to redesign the network map again, uh, because we didn't expect it to be able to do it that fast. But um, I see the RT uh, staying in Palma. Fantastic, great. Uh, well, this takes me to the question period. Uh, <laughs> questions from audience members, not myself. Uh, some more questions though. Um, so some of the questions we received in advance, uh, Manel are quite directed at you. Um, so could you talk about the strategies you use to partner with third party operators? So how did you get taxi, uh, taxi drivers interested, excited to be part of the system? Well, I guess this depends a lot on the framework uh, that each city has. Uh, in our case, uh, we already had it since 2009, so it wasn't something uh, um, that we, we didn't know or the taxi drivers didn't know at all. Uh, and also the moment was, uh, was crucial because there was no job for them and um, no one was moving around and this was the great opportunity and then I so they gave the, the opportunity to actually test it to use it and now probably uh, not maybe some not everyone but some of them for sure will stay um, so the strategy was try to convince and try to get as many taxis as uh, we could on board. Actually, we're still working on it. We're um, designing now campaigns to uh, actually get more of them on board uh, because we feel like if we have uh, enough fleet uh, taxi drivers online or on board, we will be able to guarantee the service. And that's something that it's a bit risky and we have to, to actually test it and see if uh, that works or not, and we have to redesign the, the strategy. But uh, that was our, our thing. Go with uh, the whole taxi sector. Great. They are Thank freelancers, so uh, we needed to do that that way. Okay, okay great. Thank you. Uh, so that's perhaps a unique setup uh, that the taxi drivers are their own individual contractors, their own individual um, entrepreneurs. So one other question we received in advance uh, quite often is uh, how did you combine on demand with your fixed route bus service? Uh, well, I, I guess the key is to have a nice or a great fixed route service uh, network. So if you have frequencies of um, four, five, six buses an hour, so a bus every 10, 15 minutes or less, um, this allows that the waiting time at transfers is very low. Uh, and I guess that's the, the, the key point. Um, another thing we are studying now or testing is to get fixed times to the DRT so that we can uh, set a fixed um, a schedule, transfer schedules uh, at, uh, at some point. But it's just about um, settling, uh, setting the, the right points for transferring so that you ensure that the coverage of the of the network expands, not decreases, because they only had one line, and then now they get to a point there where there's uh, four, five, six lines, and uh, they can go anywhere in the city. And that's that's the thing, I guess, is very important to set the transfer point uh, the, at the right time, at the right place, and to have a very nice um, fixed network so that it's uh, attractive, uh, just uh, a few minutes ride by taxi. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, fantastic. So, so uh, riders can either use on demand to go from point to point, or it's often used to connect with a fixed routes line. Exactly. Yeah, it's mostly to connect. It's a uh, it's designed as a feeder service, also um, attending some demands uh, such as uh, going to a hospital or something that uh, you need to provide a direct service. So it's better to provide it, but most the most use uh, users use the DRT service as a feeder of the network, yeah. Great, thank you. There's a lot of questions coming in through the chat regarding the payment structure. So uh, how has that been set up, uh, the fares for someone to ride a DRT, uh, and then let's say, uh, instead of a Palma vehicle, they're in the taxi? The fares are the same. Uh, it's just that um, if, they board the taxi, they just don't pay. 
and we assume and actually we realize that most uh, most of them like more than 95 percent transfer so since we have three transfers they actually pay when they board a fixed route bus so it's not that it's out of the system they don't pay more of for riding a taxi than a regular bus it's just that we now we need the time to to uh, establish a payment system uh, that actually they they can validate the transportation card or get um, a single trip uh, ticket uh, through an app or something that a QR or a QR um, code that the taxi drivers can validate it. That's what we are working now. But most of the um, the fare structure didn't change. It's just a transfer. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, there was quite a bit of questions coming in about that. Let me just scroll through the chat. Um, some questions also around maintaining hygiene during COVID um, and ensuring the quality of cleanliness. How have you worked with, tra uh, with the taxis to do that? Well, it was the, the responsibility of the taxi since we used the taxis that were on the street and they were not only working for EMT, but they were doing their job and uh, an EMT trip was just an, uh, in addition. Um, they were responsible of, uh, of that. And of course, we established the bus or the vehicle capacity um, as um, the regulatory frame uh, was at the moment. So at some point, it was just one people per taxi, then we could increase it to, to two people per taxi. And so with this fair platform, it was very easy to actually change the maximum capacity per vehicle. And um, and that's the the way it worked. Uh, taxis uh, take took care for for their for their part, and then we took care for the another the other two hundred buses we had here. Great, thank you, um, Lars. There's also some questions coming in about Spare's ability to integrate uh, with third party apps in our open API. Uh, actually, I, that could be for Lars or Camilla. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, so Spare has in like in the core of the company is to be open and integratable to any other solution. We want to focus on what we do best and what we do best is the backend for demand responsive transport. So we, we developed our, our open API in 2018 and since then we use it with many of our pro of, of our services. Um, we can uh, integrate into several mobility as a service applications. We have done it in, in, in several projects that we have right now. We can integrate to any front end that the client could uh, desire to, to develop, or we could use our own app. We could integrate different payment methods. We could integrate the um, KPIs and all the analysis, the data analysis with a business intelligence software. So we're absolutely open for integration uh, in especially for mobility as a service apps. Okay, so we could integrate with mobility as a service app or even with a taxi app. Yeah, well, in the in the case of the taxis, they have both, uh, if they are part of another taxi solution there, they have both solutions running and, uh, and they just get the notification for as, as Manel said before, they're working on their way. And then if they get the notification of spare, they can attend or reject that trip and then continue with their, with their work so they can both work in parallel. Great, thank you. Uh, this question um, is more broad that we've received also. It's, it's basically about uh, the goal of all transit agencies. So how do you improve service while maintaining uh, costs as they are or reducing costs? So now perhaps you'd like to give the transit agency perspective on that and then either Lars or Camilla can step in with a spare perspective. Sure. Um, since it's a public service, um, you need to make sure that your resources are devoted to get as close as you can uh, to the social optimal point. So um, having buses running empty on rural areas, have, uh, there's no sense to do it. It's not sustainable, uh, either economic nor um, uh, an ecological or in the, in the climate keeping the climate change, um, preventing the climate change actually. So um, it's just a matter not that reducing the cost, but to improve the service 
given uh, giving a better um, waiting times, reducing waiting times, reducing travel times as we did uh, by increasing a bit the cost if you just uh, keep the same buses running or maybe out of seven buses that were covering a lot of uh, fixed routes and inefficient fixed routes, you can keep one or two and then the rest it's a uh, kind of a savings or try to compensate the cost of, uh, of taxi drivers. But um, yeah, it's just a matter of thinking about where the big resources, the big buses need to be uh, rather than, than cost. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, Lars, Camila, did you have something to add? Otherwise, I'm going to, to wrap it up uh, as we're, we're, we're a little bit over. But uh, it's definitely a worthwhile question. So if you would like to add your perspective, please do. I, I think okay. Manel summed it up very well. Uh, we at Spare, we work close, very hand in hand with the operators. So we're always looking for ways to make their service more, to optimize their service. And these, the spare fleets and all these features like allow them to do that. But I think overall, it, it's a more holistic service that you have to take care not only of the economical, but all the aspects uh, together. So it, if you make a better service, have better quality, happier users, and also manage to keep the same costs or reduce them, then I think it's a success. Definitely. Thank you. So I'm going to wrap up. Uh, thank you everyone for all of your questions. I did try to, to pull from them and, and broadly ask, uh, effectively combining several questions into one. Uh, if you do have a question that wasn't answered, um, you can uh, submit it to me and my email will come in just one short slide away. Uh, but before that, I'd like to say that um, we're willing to chat with you. As Camila said, we like to work hand in hand with trans agencies. So if you would like to discuss um, the opportunity for uh, micro transit or demand responsive tra tra transit uh, in your area, whatever you call it, we'd be happy to do that with you. So, so please be in touch. Um, this is uh, my contact. It's Tanya at sparelabs.com. And then we've also included Manels, uh, who has been kind enough to answer some questions for us. So. Uh, without uh, further ado, I'd like to say thank you for sparing your time and a huge thank you to all of the panelists today.